you would please stand. We'll go over to Jude chapter 1. We'll read verses 17 through 25. Jude chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. You may be seated. Do you feel outgunned by the enemy, ill-equipped to weather attacks? Maybe you're struggling to stay afloat, keeping your family safe. Or maybe you're running out of steam, losing momentum. Every single one of us is challenged day in, day out to stay the course, to fight the good fight. Jesus reminded us that we are in a battle for the lost. We're in a battle for those we love. We're in a battle to save that for which Christ Jesus died. There are so many dangers, so many obstacles, so many hardships that we encounter day in and day out. Oftentimes we go through this life wondering why is it that we just can't seem to get any traction, why it is that when we encounter obstacles and hardships we flounder, we fumble, we drop the ball. As I began to think about a survival kit for Christians, I began to think about, well, what are the dangers out there? What are the key dangers that we as Christians encounter? I know some of the dangers when I go uh, hunting. There's obviously the danger of, of um, tripping and falling, breaking an ankle, uh, running into some wild animals. There's beer, uh, bears and, and uh, lion, mountain lions. Um, and there's snakes out there. I mean, there's all kinds of dangers that uh, hypothermia, uh, so many things um, that can hurt a person out there in the woods, I began to think about, well, what can hurt a Christian? What are some of the, the obstacles that Christians uh, face, those, uh, those deadly uh, obstacles that can really uh, upend us, that can really um, dishevel us, destroy our families, destroy uh, our lives? And of them, I, I identified three key ones. There, there's other, but I identified three key, for the sake of time, three key dangers that we as Christians will encounter in this life that we need to be prepared for. The first one is division. Division. God said what he has brought together, let no one separate. God unites husbands and wives. God unites friends. God unites people together for a purpose, for his glory, for the betterment of each. But Satan seeks to separate. He seeks to divide families, churches, relationships. That's his goal. Divide and conquer separate what God has brought together, what God has joined together. In verse 18 through 19 there, Jude says, They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. Now when we read that, we're probably, in our minds, we're thinking about pastors and deacons and church officials. No, these are individuals within our own family, within our workplaces, within our schools that seek to divide. Yes, there are those religious leaders out there that are teaching heresy, that are, that are causing people to stumble, but we have to keep in mind that the obstacles, the challenges come within our own homes. In 1 Corinthians 15.33 it says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. God warns us that our associations with this world can be very dangerous if we're not careful, if we're not discerning on who we're yoking ourselves with. This is especially challenging for you young people out there. I know it's important to you to be popular and to have friends and to be liked. 
Who doesn't? But not everybody who warms up to you is actually going to turn out to be uh, a friend. There's a high probability that those individuals that are coming up close to you are being used by Satan to bring you down. To limit you from accomplishing everything that God would have you accomplish. Matthew 10.36 it says a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. We have to keep in mind that yes we have biological family members but if they are not born of the Spirit, if they are not one with Christ, if they've not been born again, then they're still of the world. And it's very difficult when you have family members that are still in the world, family members who do not follow the ways of Christ like we do. It's very difficult for us to interact with them. There's, there's all kinds of challenges that uh, exist there in those relationships. And God warns us to be careful that um, we don't end up allowing those certain individuals to divide our homes, to divide um, our relationships um, with one another, with our family members in Christ. I like what John um, chapter 15, 18 through 19 says. It says this, Jesus declares, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. It's hard for me to understand, comprehend, but I, I do because of what the scriptures say, why a biological family member would have such animosity towards me, such bitterness towards me, why they would dislike me, why they would even go so far as hating me. Well, Jesus declared there that those in the world, if I'm not a part of this world any longer, that the world would turn against me. Those who are still, in, still following the ways of the world would be against me. Just because of my association with Christ Jesus, just because I follow Christ, that's sufficient. That's enough for them to turn their backs on me, to make my life difficult, to make it hard. If a stranger was trying to do that, I, I would more than likely already have up my guards. I would be protecting myself from the stranger. We, we all do that, right? Strangers, you know, stranger danger, danger stranger, right? Um, so we have our guards up when it comes to strangers in this world. But we drop those guards when it comes to biological family members. And then we get wounded and we get hurt and we start asking ourselves, well, why would they do that to me? I thought they loved me. Why would my family members want to hurt me? Well, Jesus said, that those who are in the world, those who are of the world, those who are not a part of the family of God, those who are not following Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life, it says that those people will actually end up being your enemies in many cases. They don't want to associate with Christ and because you associate with Christ that puts you at odds with them automatically. Again, Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. It's sad. When we have people that we love and we care about, people that we grew up with, people that, that raised us, people that were a part of a very precious moments in our lives when all of a sudden they turn on us and and they begin to dislike us and to have distaste towards us and to treat us with, with unkindness. And that's very unpleasant. That's very unpleasant. It's hard to, to endure that, to go through those kind of challenges. But Jesus said that there would be division, that people would come into our lives and they would seek to divide us, to separate us ultimately from our relationship with God. How many of you out there have had people try and pull you away from Christ? To follow the ways of the world. To influence you to follow your fleshly desires. I've had people like that. Even in, within my own family. Trying to draw me back to the way I used to be. They don't like who I am now. Christ loves who I am now. God loves who I am in Christ. But certain family members, certain friends out there detest who I am in Christ. And it baffles me. I thought initially that 
my family members and friends would actually be happy for me that I have a relationship with God, that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, that the old is gone, the new has come, and that I'm much kinder, much more patient, much more loving, much more understanding. I, I thought that they were going to value that and that my relationship with them would be much closer, but I found it to be quite the opposite. And for a long time I struggled with that. I couldn't understand why it is that my family members and friends, a lot of them were, had ill intentions. They, they no longer wanted me around. They ostracized me. They showed contempt for me. Talked behind my back. Called me Jesus freak, Bible thumper, holy roller. They criticized me for my faith in Christ Jesus. I had a hard time understanding why they would not appreciate who I am now in Christ Jesus until I read John chapter 15 verses 18 through 19. So the world is going to come at you. The world is going to attack you. The world is going to try and pull you down to separate you from Christ, to separate you from the family of God, to separate you from your wife, to separate you from your children. Satan is going to try and do that and he has so many avenues through which he can enter into our homes through the school system, through our government, right? People will come into our lives and we think initially that they're there to do us good and only to find that they're there to do us harm. And so Jesus Christ warns us that there will be division and Jude talks about it here. He said, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instinct and do not have the Spirit. Listen, if someone within your family does not have the Spirit of God in them, there's a high probability that Satan will use them at some point in time to divide you, to create hardship. I've had to put some distance between myself and certain family members because I noticed and because it became evident to me that they were trying to divide me. Trying to divide me from my God, trying to divide me from the family of God, trying to divide me from the people I love. And so I had to put some distance between me and those individuals, some safe distance. I still pray for them, I still love them, I still care about them, but I understand because of what the scriptures say that there will be people who will come into our lives to seek to divide us. Division. Again, a man's enemies will often be the members of his own household. So we have to make sure that we keep up our guards, not just for the strangers, but even those family members who have ill intentions for us. The second danger is lack of accountability. The first, division. The second, lack of accountability. Excuses for insolence, defiance without consequence when we reward bad behavior. People today don't want to be held accountable, especially our young adults today. They don't like to be told what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to act, how they're supposed to live their lives. It's a, a responsibility that parents have to raise their children to be godly, to teach them how to live, to be men and women of integrity, honor, respect, to grow up to be godly men and women. Accountability. I read there in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 22 through 24 where Eli notices that he has some uh, problems there with his sons. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 22 through 24 it says this, Now Eli was very old and he had heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He said to them, why do you do such things? The evil things that I hear from all these people. No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating. So here Eli, he has some sons and they're not living according to God's law. In fact, they're they're very uh, wayward. They're uh, living in sexual immorality. They're going their own way, which um, God forbid, uh, sleeping with the women there um, who are serving in the, in the temple. And so Eli, he hears about these, these things and he goes to his sons and he talks to them. But words only go so far. In 1 Samuel 3, 11 through 13, this is what God says to Eli because of his lack of response. Because Eli did not take the necessary measures to stop the ungodly behavior. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, 
I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. You see, Eli was very... How would I, how would I put this? Very laid back. No big deal. Yeah, they're making you know, a ruckus out there. They're doing some things they shouldn't be doing. But you know what? They're, they're kids. They'll get over it, you know. They'll grow up. They'll grow out of it. You know, he didn't want to take the time and the energy and the effort to discipline his sons. And a lot of parents today don't want to take the time and the effort to discipline their children because it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of emotions. It takes a lot of strength and stamina and endurance to stay up with your kids. And Eli had a tough time. And he finally just gave up. Says, whatever. You know, you guys, it's, you know, it's your problem. You know, God will deal with you. But God said, no, no, hold on, Eli. I put you in charge of them. You're accountable for your children, Eli's. You're accountable for them. And because you did not rebuke them, I have an issue with you. And I'm going to do something here. It's not going to be very pleasant, Eli. And so we have to hold not only our children accountable, but one other accountable as well. And that's a challenge because it's, you know, we don't like to have to approach somebody and say, hey, you know what you're doing, brother? You know what you're doing, sister? Isn't right. You need to stop that. That's, that's going to bring uh, harm to you. It's going to be harm to, to, the, to the people around you that you love. Remember that every sin will cost us something. And not only us, but the people we love as well. And so there needs to be accountability within our homes, within the church body. There needs to be accountability. We cannot afford to allow cancer to enter into our church, into, into our homes. We can't allow those fires to be lit within our homes that eventually turn into blazing wildfires that destroy our homes. And without accountability, if we let one another just run amok, if there's no, no one steering, no one directing, no one holding each other accountable, then we're going to become a wayward house, a house of disorder instead of a house of order. So there has to be accountability within our homes, within our churches. The third, apathy, apathy, lack of interest, physically present but mentally distant, which leads to carnal Christianity, carnal Christianity, apathy. We read there in Acts, Chapter 15, verse 36 through 38, it says this. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. I know we all get tired. I know that there are times when we need to take a break. But what we can quickly enter into is a condition of apathy, indifference, where we no longer have any fervor, or any fire, or any, any passion for the things of Christ, where we lose our zeal for the Lord of hosts. And it comes upon us gradually, so we don't even know it. Next thing you know, we're drifting, we're Losing our focus. We're no longer praying. We're no longer studying the Word. We're kind of just out there just going through the motions. We, yeah, we show up physically, but emotionally, we're not there. We're going through, again, the motions. We're just doing the chores, the domestic activities. We're just existing. There's no longer any drive, no longer any motivation, no longer any inspiration. We, we've kind of just disconnected, become detached from what Christ called us to engage in. And here we see that Mark, it says here that 
that he deserted them. In other words, he walked away and he no longer continued in the work of the Lord. He just kind of just throttled back. He's like, uh, you know, I'm not really interested in doing this anymore. You know, that church thing, that's kind of nice. You know, serving the poor, yeah, yeah, that was cool at the time. Yeah, praying, you know, I've done that. Yep, I've read the scriptures, uh, you know, used to read them and uh, pray, uh, worship God, praise God. You know, I've, I've been there, done that. Yeah, that's, that was nice. We start to, to drift away from God. We, we begin to put some distance between us and Him. We drift into this condition called apathy, indifference. We become lackadaisical. We just kind of just start to flounder, become stagnant, stale. There's no more drive, no more motivate. We just lose our focus. Three dangers, division, lack of accountability, and apathy. We find these to be challenging in not only our homes, but in our churches as well. Families have to be careful that people don't enter into their homes and create division, causing strife, pandemonium. We also have to make sure that parents hold their children accountable, that children hold their siblings accountable, that within the church, the adults within the church hold one another accountable, and also that we don't get caught up and don't find ourselves drowning in the river of apathy. We've got to maintain that focus on Christ, that zeal for the Lord of hosts for which we have been called. So how do we overcome these dangers? How do we survive in a very difficult and dangerous world? What are some of the survival steps? Let me begin with number one. Be careful with whom you associate. Be careful with whom you associate. In 1 Corinthians 5.11 it says this, But actually I wrote to you, do not associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler not even to eat with such a one so here we we read where Paul is saying listen be careful who you're associating with now it doesn't mean that we're not to to interact with the unbelievers no we have to do that Christ has called us to reach out to that which is lost. But we have to be very careful of who we bring into our inner circles. We have to be discerning. And parents, as the responsible member of the family, we have to make sure that, those, that, our, that our children, those associations that they have, are healthy. It's your responsibility as parents to make sure that those uh, individuals your kids are hanging out with are, are of good rapport. That they're individuals that are, are upstanding, that they're, they're going to add value to your children's lives and not drag them down, but encourage them and lift them up. Be careful. Paul says with, with those people out there who are immoral, covetousness, idolaters, revilers, drunkards, swindlers, don't even eat with such a person. Put yourself some distance between you and them. Proverbs 23, 6-8 says, Do not eat the bread of a selfish man, or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, Eat and drink, but in his heart, he's not with you. You will vomit up the morsels you have eaten, and waste your compliments. The author there in Proverbs says, Do not eat the bread of a selfish man, or desire his delicacies. In other words, don't desire the things of this world. Those things which selfish people pursue and desire and seek for personal gain. He says, don't even desire their delicacies. Don't even desire to have fellowship with such a, an individual. Those selfish, self-centered individuals out there. Here again, the authors of the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ, is talking about us being discerning with regards to those people in our lives, in our circles. Being mindful of who they are. The second is watch out for envy and selfishness. Envy and selfishness. So the first one, be careful who you associate. But also watch out for envy and selfishness within your own circle. Keep yourself accountable that you don't stumble into envy and selfishness. I noted there in one of the quotes from um, Harold Griff Coffin, Envy is the art of counting another's blessings instead of your own. When we start counting what other people have rather than what we have, we enter into envy and covetousness. 
Watch out for envy and selfishness. James chapter 3 verse 16. Where were you? For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Watch this. For wherever you have envy and selfish ambition, just those two, envy and selfishness, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Envy and selfishness. We have, should have a distaste for envy and selfishness to not even associate with selfish and envious people. Paul says, be careful with your associations. In Proverbs 24.1, it says, Do not envy the wicked. Do not desire their company. Again, God gives us warning throughout Scripture to be careful of who we're associating with and to watch out for certain indicators such as envy and selfishness. The third, fight your fears. Fight your fears. In Proverbs 29 Verse 25, it says this, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Again, fear of man will prove to be a snare. Who are you afraid of today? Are there individuals out there in the world that are causing you to, to fear? Maybe it's your boss at work. Maybe it's your company that you work for. Maybe it's a neighbor that's striking fear in your heart. Maybe it's a person you had a relationship in the past with that's, that's come back into your circle and they're causing problems, creating fear and dissension. Do not fear man, for it will be a snare to you. We're to fear only the Lord Jesus Christ, our God. Fear Him out of reverence, out of love. Not as if when we were once kids and we were afraid of the dark. That's not the fear that is being spoken of here. It's talking about that reverence for our Heavenly Father. That love for the one above. In 1 Peter 3.14 it says this, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Listen, you don't have to fear the threats of the world. If somebody is threatening you today, especially you youngsters, if you young uh, kids here with us this morning, if, if somebody's threatening you, you don't have to fear their threats. It says here, do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Why is that? Because God has assembled His angels to encamp around you. God has put His guardian angels to keep you safe. That's why you don't have to fear the world around you. For those who threaten you, threaten your home, threaten your families, you don't have to fear them. You can stand up against them, but you don't have to fear them. And when you don't fear them, you will stand up against them. In Psalm 118.6 it says this, The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Listen, if you're going to survive in this very dangerous world, you're going to have to get fear under control. You're going to have to fight your fears. You're going to have to be careful whom you associate. Watch out for envy and selfishness and fight against fear. The threats. The fourth one is stay close to the family of God. Stay close to the family of God. Apollos says there in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 through 25, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, we see the day of Christ approaching. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing to return. And therefore it says that we're not to forsake meeting together. In other words, coming together as the body of Christ. Assembling together. Enjoying each other's company. Fellowshipping. For you see, when we stand together, when we come together as a body, there's strength in numbers. There's accountability. We can fight against envy and selfishness. We can encourage one another not to give in to their fears. We can stand beside one another and lift each other up in those times of need. It's a commandment of God that we continue to build the family of God, strengthen the family of God, encourage the family of God, pray for the family of God, motivate the family of God. We need to be connected to the body of Christ. God never intended for us to drift 
through this world by ourselves to be like a satellite just wandering around out there flying solo drifting from here to there no Christ says get connected get plugged in find a home the body of Christ and get involved begin to build good solid Christian relationships and the fifth one and last one test what you believe against the Word of God listen test what you believe we believe a lot of things but is it really the truth is what we're believing in really the truth there are times when I believed in in something only to find out that what I was believing in was untrue you see growing up in a specific denomination I was I was told that that was the only denomination to belong to that if I belonged to any other denomination out there that I'd go to hell that I'd lose my salvation, that'd fall from grace, that I had to stay underneath this particular umbrella if I was going to be saved. And so I looked at everyone else out there as unbelievers, everybody, except those that belonged to this particular denomination. I, I believed that everyone out there was a heretic, they were all going to hell, that I was the only one and, and those people in, that were part of the denomination were the only ones going to heaven. That's what I believed until I tested that belief against the scriptures only to find out that God has one house but within that one house there are many rooms. There are many rooms within, within which Christ Jesus is present, within which the blood of Jesus Christ is preached, within which Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father where Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and those who put their trust in Him shall be saved. You see, I, I grew up very narrow-minded with respect to, to some of the things that God was, was trying to reveal to me. I had these blinders on, I had these shades on and I, I wasn't willing to look to the Scriptures to see that God's house is much wider, much vaster than by little world I was living in. Just because someone told you just because someone said something to you long ago and that you embraced it as the as the gospel of truth if you haven't tested it against the scriptures is it really the truth so if we're going to survive in this very difficult and challenging world we're going to need to test what we believe against the Word of God listen to first John chapter 4 verse 1 dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world listen Satan is trying to deceive you he's telling you things and he's telling you things through people that you have put your trust in individuals that do not have the spirit of the Lord but somehow throughout time you've developed these relationships with these ungodly individuals and so they're influencing you and they're teaching you things and you're falling for it and you're believing it and you're not taking it and placing it up and aligning it against the scriptures and therefore you are on a pathway that leads to heresy and so Christ Jesus would say test what you believe against the Word of God be careful of whom you associate with watch out for every situation where there's envy and selfishness fight your fears stay close to the family of God and test what you believe against the Word of God if you will do these things, I can guarantee you, God will guarantee you that there will be less division in your home, that there will be accountability within your home, that apathy, indifference will be a thing of the past. Not only in our homes, but in our relationships with the body of Christ. God has called us to a higher calling, to live to a standard that Christ has set, that Christ has role modeled. You struggling today with division in your home? Maybe in, in your relationship with your spouse? Maybe in your relationship with your child? Look to see if there's any selfishness. Look to see if there's in that relationship any envy. Look to see if there's any, uh, any beliefs that don't line up to the Word of God. Begin to look around you. Begin to test. Begin to evaluate. Begin to to seek to understand what's going on what's creating this division in my home 
We do this quite regularly here at Acacia Worship Center. I take an assessment. I look to see if there's any division, any strife. To see how indeed can we blend, can we mend these relationships. How we can get rid of division, strife, anger, envy, jealousy. We're going to have to take ourselves seriously when it comes to the things of Christ if we're going to survive in a very difficult and challenging world. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with, with Christ today, if you're standing strong, if you're standing firm, but let us bow our heads and let's go before the Father and let's, let's be honest with ourselves. Have we allowed division to enter into our home? Have we failed to hold one another accountable? Have we become apathetic? Indifferent? Have we lost our focus and drifted from the things that are important to God?